بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحابته أجمعين اللهم إني نويت التعلم والتعليم والتذكر والتذكير والنفع والانتفاع والإفادة والاستفادة والحث على التمسك بكتاب الله وسنة رسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم والدعاء إلى الهدى والدلالة على الخير ابتغاء وجه الله ومرضاته وقربه وثوابه سبحانه وتعالى سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم يا الله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ومولانا محمد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته الحمد لله we are now moving uh, toward the second uh, period of three in this blessed month the first 10 days are now almost uh, behind us and we are looking forward to the next set of 10 days the days of forgiveness and we know that the first 10 days being the days of mercy and then the second 10 days being days of forgiveness and then the last 10 days being emancipation from the fire that as with everything in our deen there is a perfect symmetry to the order in which these days have been given to us. We know that mercy leads to reflection. When we are merciful towards others, mercy comes as a result of reflection and it gives us opportunity to be more reflective. And reflection leads one to acknowledge shortcomings. It leads one to acknowledge trespasses. It leads one to um, recognize our shortcomings and our faults, both in our deen and in our dunya towards others. And once we recognize our shortcomings, it leads to forgiveness and seeking forgiveness ultimately leads to emancipation from the fire. We know that the return um, in Arabic, taba yatubu, which is a word for uh, repentance or forgiveness, seeking forgiveness. It comes from the Arabic word taba yatubu, which means to return. And we know that the return is guaranteed. It just depends whether our return is coupled with having sought forgiveness. Because we know that we're going to be returning back. But is our journey back to Allah, are we going to be in our bags with us, have with us the repentance from where we've just come? The great uh, scholar of this deen, Qatada, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, Inna al-Qur'an yudullukum ala da'ikum wa dawa'ikum. That the Qur'an, it points out to you and for you, it points out your illnesses and it also gives you your remedies. Inna al-Qur'an yudullukum ala da'ikum wa dawa'ikum. It points out your illnesses, your ailments, and it also gives you remedies. He said, Amma, amma As for your ailments, as for your illnesses, they are your sins. In other words, he's saying your sins are your illnesses, your, Ill, your, your illnesses and your ailments. And as for what medicates us against that, what makes us better, returns us to a state of health, is your istighfar. It said that if one feels uneasy in oneself, anxious, or that worry has overtaken one's heart, um, as if the world is weighing down on our shoulders, the scholars say that know that one stands in need of istighfar. And not just istighfar, but an increase in one's saying of istighfar. We know that istighfar cleanses and purifies one heart, one's heart. The scholars, they tell us that sins are a form of darkness. They, they're a form of darkness that essentially envelops the heart, which each sin increasing the darkness of one's heart. And we are told by Sayyidina Abu Huraira in a hadith, إِنَّ الْمُؤْمِنِ إِذَا أَذْنَبَ ذَنْبًا كَانَ نُكْتَ سَوْدَى فِي قَلْبِهِ That if a believer... Um, were to sin or when he sins there is a black dot that's placed in his heart 
فَاسْتَغْفَرَ وَاسْتَغْفَرْ سَقَلَ مِنْهَا that but if you were to seek forgiveness and turn back to Allah his heart will become polished again وَإِنْ زَادْ زَادَتْ حَتَّى يُغَلَّفْ بِهَا قَلْبُهُ that if he uh, if he increases in his sins those black dots will keep increasing until it envelops his heart and that's why it says in the allah azza wa jal in the quran tells us that bal kalla bal rana ala qulubihi that there's a rust that becomes uh, enveloped around one's heart and you know when something becomes rusty it not only becomes uh, displeasing to look at but also it becomes difficult to remove istighfar is the process of removing and purifying one's heart of that rust it removes sins and the effects of sins but sometimes that rust might require some time you know if if you've left a plate out in the sink for days on end and haven't washed it it's going to take some effort to get that dirt off now because it's just become settled in that plate it's like that with the heart. If la samahallah, if ran, if this rust settles into the heart now, it's going to require some polishing. A scholar was once asked the question, which is better for a person? For a person to do tasbih, i.e. say subhanallah, or for a person to do istighfar? And he said, well, if a garment is clean, then perfume suits it better. But if a garment is dirty, then soap is better for it. In other words, if you are someone who feels that you know, you're on the right path, things are going well, then perfume, i.e. do subhanallah. He's equating fragrance to tasbih, to subhanallah. But he's equating someone who's coming with, a, with, with a, an ocean's worth of sins, like a dirty garment, and it requires soap, it requires cleansing. And so in that instance and in that circumstance, istighfar is what we need. We know that Allah has promised the one who seeks his forgiveness, that he will forgive him. We know that. Theologically, it is forbidden for us to think that when we turn to Allah sincerely with repenting hearts, that Allah won't forgive us. It's impermissible for us to think that. We must believe theologically that if we turn to Allah sincerely asking for forgiveness, he will forgive us. It's haram to think that he will not forgive us. Allah tells us, wa inni." La ghaffarun liman tab. It's this in, in the Quran is such a, a, an emphatic way of saying that I am the one who forgives the one who turns to me. I'm the one who, who, who forgives. Allah says in the Quran, وَمَن يَعْمَلْ أَوْ يَظْلِمْ نَفْسَهُ The one who engages in sinful acts or oppresses his own soul. ثُمَّ يَسْتَغْفِرِ اللَّهِ And then he turns to Allah and seeks forgiveness. يَجِدِ اللَّهَ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا He will find Allah waiting for him, merciful, forgiving. Now, we're told that if we want our book of deeds uh, to please us on a day of judgment, then we should engage in istighfar. We're told in a hadith by uh, Zubair bin Awam عنه, that the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ أَحَبَّ أَنْ تَسُرَّهُ صَحِيفَتُهُ فَلْيُكْثِرْ فِيمَا uh, that anyone who wishes their book of deeds on a day of judgment to please them, then they should engage much in the practice of istighfar. But not only that, you see, istighfar extends to, to parts of our lives that we may not even think about. We're told again in the Quran by Allah Azza wa Jal that istighfar is a means of increasing our sustenance, our food, our provisions. It's a means for why the rain uh, descends from the heavens. It's a reason why Allah grants us children. It's a means why Allah grants us wealth. Where are we told this in the Quran? When Nuh alayhi salam in Surah Nuh, he, he says to his people, istaghfiru uh, rabbakum innahu kana ghaffara. Seek Allah's forgiveness. He will forgive you. He is the forgiving. Yursil sama alaykum midrara. The heavens, they will send down rain. Mid rain midrara is rain that doesn't stop. It just keeps on, keeps on, keeps on. And he will increase you in wealth and children. And he will make for you your provisions. In other words, he'll, he'll make your gardens uh, sprout forth 
all that you need. He will make for you rivers. And Muqatil, in interpreting this verse, he tells us that when the people of Sayyidina Nuh, that when they kept rejecting his message, Allah withheld the rain from them. When they rejected his message, Allah withheld the rain. And no children were born to those people for 40 years. No children were born to those people for 40 years and their crops came to ruin. And when they saw this, they went to Sayyidina Nuh alayhi salam. And that's when he said to them, Istaghfiru rabbakum. Seek forgiveness from Allah. And if you do that, yursil is sama alaykum midrara. The rain will come down. He will increase you in your wealth, give you children, make for you gardens that sprout forth what you need, make for you these rivers that from which you can drink. So it's the far as you can see a, a causative, it's a means to giving us the things that maybe ordinarily wouldn't associate with that. But you see, it's the far is it's something that's linked to our being as uh, in terms of our character. Imam al-Ghazali, the great Imam, he speaks about the ability of man to change his character in the Mizan al-Amal. The ability of man, that man has to change character. Our actions are uh, a result of our character. Our actions, they are a result of our character. Everything we do, it's a sign of who we are. And if we're unable to change, if it were the case that we're unable to change our character, there would be no meaning to the warnings that Allah has given us, to the counsel that we've been given, to the advice that we've been given, the admonishment that we've been given in the Quran or by the Prophet If we weren't able to change our character, there would be no, why would Allah tell us all those things then? No. Imam Ghazali really uh, gives us a beautiful and important insight about the human condition here. He says that before we are able to properly use our reason, we as children, when we're children, uh, we live in a world dominated by our senses. In other words, we live in a, uh, in, in, a, in a child's world of desire. I want this, I want that. Now, in an innocent sense, a, child, a child's world is about fulfilling uh, its desires in an innocent sense because it's, it's living in a sensorial world. So a child's world is about fulfilling its desire. But for a child, that's okay. Why? Because a child hasn't learned to use its intellect fully yet. A child is not intellectually mature. A child is not what they term legally compos mentis. It doesn't have the, it doesn't understand its actions. It doesn't understand the concept of consequence. If I do this, this is going to happen. It doesn't really understand that. But as the child grows toward adulthood, its ability to reason grows. It becomes stronger. And a child is now able to, well, it's not a child anymore, it becomes an adult. It's now able to understand actions and consequences of actions. But Imam Ghazali tells us some people, they refuse to use their intellect when it has become, when, when the intellect has become fully functional now. They refuse to use this gift that's been given to us by Allah. And because of that, they remain in a childlike state. Their desires remain dominant over their intellect. Now, the intellect is, the, is, as Imam Ghazali tells us, it's the gift that's been given to us by Allah. And it's only because of the intellect that we are held accountable in front of Allah. No other species in existence is accountable in front of Allah. Why? Because they have no intellect. Animals, plants, inanimate things, because they don't have intellects, they are not going to be accounted. But because we have intellect, we are the recipients of Allah's taklif, responsibility. We are answerable for our actions. But imagine now if someone doesn't use their intellect. In other words, they haven't really, they haven't gone into adulthood. They're choosing to remain in a childlike state where their desires may continue to dominate them. That's okay for a child, but then it becomes not okay for an adult because it has the tool to discern. Now, we as parents can either help the child in overcoming its childness as he, the child grows by teaching the child, or we can continue to indulge the child in all it wants, whenever it wants, however it wants. And if we do that, then we are partly responsible for keeping our children as they move into adulthood into this child in this childlike state, unable to really function as adults in the way that we expect adults to function. 
Now, coming back to uh, the idea of tawbah and istighfar and maghfira, that we find that tabarakallah, that there are a number of names of Allah, a number of Allah's beautiful names that relate to the concept of forgiveness. Al-Tawwab, Al-Ghaffar, Al-Ghafur, and Al-Afu. Four names of Allah's beautiful names relate to the idea of forgiveness, but they each have a slightly nuanced meaning. If you look at the word, uh, I beg your pardon, if you look at the beautiful name At-Tawwab, the ever relenting, the one who always turns to his slaves when they turn to him, this tells us that Allah is giving us signs to return to him. That's how Allah sent, set the world up, you see. The world is a series of signs. That's how Allah set the world up. And um, when, when we do return to him in repentance, we find Allah is ever relenting to us. So the idea of tawab is when we see the signs of Allah, we reflect on those signs and we turn back to Allah. And it's a constant state that we find Allah is forgiving, 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 forgiving. This concept of forgiveness is echoed then in uh, the seerah. We see, for instance, that the Prophet ﷺ, how is he forgiving towards the people that are essentially at war with him? Forget people who are living as, quote unquote, friends or relatives within communities. We're speaking about people who are outright at war with him. If you look at Fath Makkah, when Allah gave the Muslims victory in Makkah, and I should just pause here because the word Fath is often uh, rendered into English as conquer. We Muslims have never been conquerors, and we should never use that word. We never conquered any, any country or any land. The word in Arabic that's used is called Fath, and Fath is a divine opening. In other words, it is Allah who gave you this victory. That's it. Conquering is something that relates to the tyranny of man, if you like. But it relates to the power of man. We recognize that we have no power. That's why we call it a fath, Allah's divine opening, Allah's victory for us. So at Fath Makkah, what did the people do? They came to the Prophet ﷺ. The same people who had been persecuting Muslims for a period of 20 odd years. And they said to the Prophet ﷺ that, you know, you're an Akhun Karim. You're a noble, generous brother. We know in Arabic uh, that the word Karam relates to the word Shaja'a. Someone who is Karim, i.e. generous, it follows that they are brave, Shuja'a. And likewise, someone who Shuja'a, brave, likewise, it follows that they are generous. And so they are saying to the Prophet, salam, you are the generous brother. In other words, you're the brave brother. And what does the Prophet salam, do? He forgives him. He forgives everyone in Makkah. لا تثريب عليكم اليوم There's not, You have nothing to worry about today. Likewise, we see that during war, the Prophet ﷺ is during war lifting and raising his hands to the heavens and saying, Allah maghfir qawmi fa innuhum la ya'lamu. Oh Allah, forgive my people, they don't know. They're fighting me, but they don't know. This is important for us to keep in mind because this is a group of people who are at war with the Prophet ﷺ and he's seeking forgiveness for them. Now. Then we have Allah's name, Al-Ghaffar. Al-Ghaffar is the one who is full of forgiveness. And this differs from Al-Ghafur, which is the most perfect form of forgiveness. So you have the idea of full forgiveness and you have the idea of a perfect form of forgiveness. And this is what these two names, Ghaffar and Ghafur, uh, relate to. We're told in the Quran, one of the most hopeful verses, they, it's the scholars, they debate amongst themselves, that someone who has spent a lifetime sinning, lifetime sinning, hardly has any good deeds in the bank. What, what, where can we turn to in the Quran that's going to give us some hope? And this is this verse here. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِ الَّذِينَ قُلْ يَا عِبَادِ يَالَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَتُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ My servants who have harmed yourselves by your own excess, you've gone to excess, You've just gone so far away. Completely just, you know, you've, 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 you've gone beyond the bounds. Do not despair of Allah's mercy. Allah forgives all sins. He is truly the most forgiving and the most merciful. They say that this verse 
is the verse that gives the believers the most hope on the day of judgment. That no matter how far someone's gone, the door of forgiveness is always open as long as we want to walk through it. And the last of Allah's name that relates to the concept of forgiveness is Al-Afu. And how is Al-Afu different from the other names? Al-Afu literally means someone who not just forgives, but who effaces sins. In other words, wipes out sins completely. The places that one sinned, they forget. The, the people around whom one sins, they forget. It's like it never happened. Al-Afu is literally wiping the slate clean. It's not saying, look, that's your sin, but I've forgiven it. No. Afu is, it's like you never had that sin in the first place. And that's why we ask Allah, innahu afuwan kareem, that he is the one who effaces sins, the generous one. Now, but he goes one step beyond that and says, and then I will turn your sins into good deeds as well. Now, that's the reality of Allah's mercy. These are the days of Allah's, Allah's forgiveness right now. And so that's why we should then move into a state of thankfulness in these days instead of complaining. We should move into states of patience over anger, into states of courage over fear, into states of tawakkul over worry, into states of other people over ourselves, into states of being content rather than always grumbling, you see. We... we, we we, the, 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 the sign of the modern age that we live in is that uh, we, the most precious commodity that's bought and sold in the world today is no longer oil, it's no longer gas, it's no longer gold, but it's us. The thing that corporations pay the most money for nowadays is our data, the things that we use. So what's essentially being bought and sold is us. And we have to really reflect on that because that's, that the more we allow them to sell us, the more it means that we are entrenched in the world. Because if we're not part of the data set that they're buying and selling, that's a good sign that we're not part of the dunya. <laughs> because they don't care if you're, not part, if you're not part of the dunya, that means you're not in a data set. But if you're in the data set, the more you are in a data set, the more data they have to know how to manipulate you and how to sell you things. You see? So we have to become conscious of that and move into these states of recognizing our function as human beings, as being the recipients of divine responsibility, of being recipients of the divine gift of one's intellect, that we use it in our lives to move to Allah in a way that's pleasing to him. And inshallah, you know, we make dua that Allah gives us all, all, all tawfiq uh, to be able to do that. Uh, we'll stop here inshallah today. Uh, and we'll pick up um, um, next week, inshallah, which is, um, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's 10 here for us, for, for us today here in Istanbul. It's 17, which is a day of Badr. Uh, so maybe we'll have um, opportunity to say a few things about the wondrous day of Badr. Uh, in addition to um, uh, the last 10 days, which are the emancipation from the fire. Uh, inshallah, thank you all for joining and uh, uh, we look forward tomorrow to our beloved brother Sheikh Ahmed Abdu all the way from Australia uh, to come and uh, give us a, another reminder inshallah in these days which are unfortunately moving so fast it's unbelievable that we've almost come to the end of the first third but inshallah we hope that these are days of great blessings so until next week inshallah Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuhu